Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Prove Me Wrong podcast. As always, I'm your host, Pete Lieb. I'm glad you're with me again tonight. I have a great show lined up tonight. We are going to take a history lesson tonight. My guest is Mr. Randy Crable, and he is going to discuss his book, Tulsa 1921, which tells the story of the Tulsa Race Massacre, one of the most tragic and blatant examples of racism that wasn't taught in my school growing up, and as far as I can tell, isn't taught in any school, maybe outside of Tulsa itself, and I'll ask Randy about that. History, though, seems under attack right now in the United States. The prevailing feeling is, it seems to me, that history can should not be remembered or learned from, good and bad, but erased completely and forgotten if it offends even one person. An individual's entire life, all of their good works and accomplishments can be canceled based on one instance of bad judgment or a practice that may have been socially acceptable at the time but is now wide, widely condemned as it should be. Monuments and statues are being vandalized, removed, or both. Uh, essentially because of the duality of man, and there, there really is no one perfect human, myself or any of us included. And there is a saying that goes something like, history is written by the victors. And largely, I would assume that to be true. History is written in a way that would put the best possible light on those who are writing it and selectively omit cr circumstances that may illuminate some of the darker sides of who we are. Because again, no one person is perfect. Um, so but normally, if we are honest with ourselves, we're able to revisit and remember those events, those darker times, no matter how painful it is, and learn from them and be better people going forward. Uh, so once again, those who don't do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. So tonight, Randy and I are going to revisit one of the dark corners of our collective past, the Tulsa race riot of 1921, in the hopes of never repeating it. Randy Crable is an Oklahoma native and a graduate of Oklahoma State University. He arrived at the Tulsa World in 1979 as a sports writer and has remained there ever since. He's reported on a wide range of topics, including college football, boxing, politics, and the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. In 1999, he was assigned uh, to cover the coverage of the Tulsa race riot, a panel established by the Oklahoma legislature to investigate the events of May 31 through June 1, 1921, and their aftermath. This began two decades of research and reporting that became the basis of the book that we're going to talk about tonight, Tulsa 1921, Reporting a Massacre, which was published in September of 2019 and will be the basis of the discussion we're going to have tonight. The book was named Oklahoma Department of Libraries Nonfiction Book of the Year and the Oklahoma Historical Society's Book of the Year. Randy lives in Tulsa, where he continues to report on issues related to race and the race massacre as well as national politics and government. He's a member of the Oklahoma Journalism Hall of Fame. You can find more on Randy on his website, randycrable.com. You can also find his book on amazon.com. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and say welcome, Randy, to the Prove Me Wrong podcast. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, could you start me off just a little bit more? I know I gave a little bit of a bio there, but can you start me off a little more of your history uh, you started with the Tulsa world as a sports writer. How did you transition into politics? Um, well, I, I, there were a couple of intermediate steps, but I, I was a sports writer until uh, early in 1993. And then I, I moved over to the news side. I covered actually higher education for a while. Uh, and then I became kind of a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, kind of a, a, a special assignment reporter. I mm -hmm. basically to the city editor and, and did whatever they needed to, me to do. And that eventually included covering uh, the race riot commission as it was known then. And, uh, and since then, I've just sort of evolved uh, into covering a, a, a number of things. Well, again, I, we talked about it just briefly before you and I came on the air and I had never heard of the Tulsa race riot. I'm from Ohio originally, so it was not something that was ever taught in my school. Uh, actually, I, I found out about it maybe six months ago. I watched, I was watching a television show called Love Lovecraft Country on HBO. You may have seen mm -hmm. it, you may not have. They had an episode which, which um, the circumstances involved the race riots in Tulsa. And I watched this episode and I said, 
there's no way this happened. This didn't actually happen, right? This is a fictional uh, account. And so I went on Google just to make sure that it was fictional. And sure enough, it had really happened. And I had never heard of it. And I'm 47 years old. So that's when I went online and I said, okay, who can I find to, to talk to about this? So um, can you describe, for those who aren't familiar, uh, what the Greenwood District of Tulsa is and some of the history of that area? All right, well, the, the uh, Greenwood area uh, originated at the corner of Greenwood and Archer. Uh, and at the time, that, uh, it, it really began about 1905. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Tulsa uh, goes back to about 1882, but it wasn't incorporated until 1898. It was platted shortly after that. And uh, so at that time, the, uh, Greenwood and Archer were in the northeast corner of, of the town, and it pretty quickly grew beyond the city limits. And it was, uh, so it was the area where the, the, the black population for the most part lived. And it developed into a really um, active business district. And uh, uh, people sort of made a, uh, uh, an agreement or a pact that they were gonna keep their money in their community as much as possible. And they, and they did business with each other. And, and that was you know, pretty significant at that time because to a large extent, uh, black populations in the United States had very little economic um, independence. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you know, you, you work for white people, you've had to buy everything from white people. If you sold something, you probably sold it to a white person. So the ability to have your own business and to have some sort of uh, independence, both economically and politically was a pretty big deal. So were they able was this just uh, how was the uh, in the community built? How was the economy built? Was were they producing things, or was it a kind of a circular economy where you know people worked at at, at certain uh, customer service roles that then serviced other folks who then worked at customer right. service roles? How did that economy work? Well, it, you know, it had acquired the the name of Wall, Black Wall Street, but um, really it was more like a Black Main Street. Uh huh. And, and so uh, there were a lot of uh, small businesses, hotels, uh, some cafes, not really any financial institutions. It wasn't really like Wall Street. There weren't banks or, yeah. or anything like that. Uh, and you know, most of the people who lived there uh, did uh, work uh, in, I guess you would say, in the white world. I mean, they were, again, uh, the, the limitations on the black population, I think uh, we don't really appreciate today. I didn't appreciate them, appreciate what they were really. It, it was something I knew on kind of an intellectual level, but it didn't, I didn't really comprehend it until I, you know, started working on this. So the, the, the kinds of occupations that the black people could have were, were pretty limited. And, uh, and so they did work, you know, they, they made, they, they worked for wages. They were, uh, they, uh, they were uh, domestics, uh, cooks, mechanics, laborers. Mm -hmm. Some of them worked on the railroad. There was a professional class in Greenwood, um, some doctors, some lawyers, uh, teachers, um, uh, clergymen, and, um, uh, but again, they're, even they were limited because, uh, you know, the, their clients were the other, the other African-Americans. They, they weren't, uh, their clients or patients were not uh, rich white people on the other side of the railroad tracks. So it was, a, you know, they, they, you know, you hear different numbers, but the bottom line was is that money turned over uh, many times in Greenwood. In other words, uh, uh, somebody would bring their wages uh, back and uh, they'd go to the local stores and buy uh, groceries and clothes and, you know, get their hair cut and, uh, you know, go to the movies. There were some theaters there and things like that. And that stayed in the community. And then those people use that money and they, you know, so it just, it, it, it circulated in the community. 
What was the population at its zenith? What was the population of Greenwood at that time? Well, Greenwood actually reached its peak. Uh, it, it rebuilt after the massacre, and it reached its peak after World War II. Okay. But in 1921, there were probably seven or 8,000 people living there. You got a phone? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Oh, no problem. All right. Um, so what were the relations like between the white and black sections of, you said that the, the Greenwood, as they became more prosperous, they began to expand. What were the relations like between uh, those two different right. sections of the city? Because they were truly segregated, basically, what you're saying, yes? Yes, it, it, it was. Now, there were quite a few black people who actually lived in the white section of town because they lived in servants' quarters. Okay. And, and there was a fairly large uh, black rural population. But in terms of, of, of uh, Greenwood and, and the white uh, population, um, well, there had not been any real uh, overt uh, conflict. Uh, but, you know, you, the situation was this. Uh, and several things were happening all at one time. Okay. So Tulsa, you know, Tulsa went from uh, about 2,000 people in 1898 to over 75,000 people in 1920. It grew really rapidly wow. because of because of oil. It was the financial and manufacturing and transportation center of what's called the Mid Continent oil field, and um, and, it, and there was a lot of money went through that city during World War I because of all the oil uh, that was, that was uh, going, going to the war effort. So there was a lot of money. Some of that uh, uh, translated into uh, more money for, for uh, black folks. Um, and then in 1919 and 1920, several things happened. One is that you had a black uh, uh, World War veterans returning home and, uh, you know, they just fought, you know, the, the war to make the world safe for democracy. And they'd like to see some of that democracy at home. Yeah. You know? And uh, and then uh, also there was a pretty severe recession or depression uh, in in uh, uh, well, really throughout the country uh, because you had all these war veterans coming home looking for work. Uh, commodity prices had been high. Wages had been high during the war and all of that. And, and so all of that just pretty much collapsed. All of these things were creating tensions. Um, you've gone through the period during the Wilson administration when uh, segre segregation and discrimination had actually increased. Um, you know, a few weeks before uh, the uh, uh, the massacre, the, the riot. There were a couple of, uh, there was an elderly black couple who were arrested for refusing to give up their seats on the streetcar in Tulsa. And uh, and it didn't get much attention. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've long wondered if there wasn't something pretty telling about, about that little uh, piece of information. So I think these, these tensions were rising. There, there's also, you know, another thing that was going on um, throughout the war. There was kind of a, 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 a vigilante uh, element to life in Tulsa, and really throughout a lot of the country, because you had a lot of this, uh, you know, America first, and um, or I'm sorry, not America first, 100% Americanism. That was that was the deal. The, the, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, the second Klan had been organized. Um, and so um, just just a lot of uh, sort of tensions below below the surface. And um, whites tended to look at Greenwood as kind of a, as pretty much a slum. But blacks looked at it as a place that was a lot better than most of the places they had come from. Mm -hmm. And it was a place of opportunity for them. And it was, a, uh, I think, as much as anything, 
it, it, again, it was a place where they had a certain amount of, of independence and self-determination. So what was the actual event that, you know, we talked about some tensions building and some of the factors that, that ultimately precipitated what happened, but what was the specific, was there a specific event that led them to say, okay, you know, we're going to go across, uh, we're going to cross the line and, and I don't know if they meant that for this to happen, for what happened to actually go down, but what was it that led to May 31st? I, you know, I, for me, I think it's 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 kind of a, a, a series of things uh -huh. that if any if there had been intervention or or one of them it had not happened, you know maybe the whole thing would not have happened. But at any rate, you know the sort of the accepted story is that on the morning of May 30th, actually, which was a, a Memorial Day, um. A, a, a young black man uh, who was identified as Dick Rowland uh, got on an elevator in a downtown office building. And the building was pretty empty because, again, it was a holiday. And Memorial Day was a really big holiday in those days because yeah. it, was just, it was just after the war. Right, and so yeah. you had a war dead and everything. Everybody was trying to prove how, the, how uh, patriotic they were. So the building was pretty empty. He got on the elevator. Uh, and uh, the, a young white uh, girl uh, was operating it. And on the way down, uh, she screamed. And uh, when the elevator got to the first floor, Dick Rowland took off running. There was a bystander there who called the police. And um, so after an investigation, the next day on May 31st, uh, the police, the Tulsa police, arrested Dick Rowland and brought him in, uh, and uh, reportedly on a charge of attempted assault. Now, or uh, I'm sorry, assault, which in the language of the day meant rape or attempted rape. And this was the kind of thing that had got had gotten a lot of black men killed mm -hmm. in the United States and especially in the South uh, over the last, uh, well you know, forever, really, but yeah. especially in, in, in recent years, uh, there'd been an uptick in violence. And um, so everybody was kind of on edge. And um, in the Tulsa Tribune, which was the afternoon paper, ran a story on the front page. It was not a banner headline, uh, but it was a kind of an eye-grabbing headline in uh, this, the, the kind of um, a little bit, uh, well, I would say sensationalized. It really, it was, it, it was pretty loaded. The language was pretty loaded. And um, so uh, some black folks uh, read this and thought, okay, they're going to try and do something with Dick Rowland. And in fact, the police commissioner said he received a telephone call from somebody who said, we're going to get, we're going to get this guy. Uh, and I, I, I should mention that there had actually been a lynching from the Tulsa County Jail the previous summer. And on that same summer, a black man had been uh, lynched, taken from the Oklahoma County Jail, which is Oklahoma City, and lynched. This was the same weekend. And that had prompted uh, some of the black leaders in Tulsa to say, well, they, we're, they are not going to do that to one of our guys. So Dick Rowland was put in the Tulsa County Jail. It, it was actually a pretty secure jail. It was on the mm -hmm. top floor of the courthouse. It was difficult to get into. The man who'd been lynched the previous year, they, they accomplished that by taking the uh, then sheriff hostage. Uh, I think there was some suspicion that maybe it was, a, it was kind of an inside deal. Yeah, in, uh, the sheriff had changed in the interim, and the, and the sheriff in 1921 was pretty adamant that they were not going to take Dick Rowland. So at any rate, uh, white crowds started gathering around the courthouse, kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, and then some uh, uh, black men who were determined that nothing was going to happen to Dick Rowland showed up. Uh, they were armed. That got the crowd more upset. Um, and at this point, you know, today we would expect law enforcement and the National Guard to show up and, uh, you know, try and disperse 
the crowd. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, well, and uh, it didn't happen. It was basically the white sheriff and his black deputy out on the courthouse steps trying to get several hundred people to, to go home. And initially, the black men did go home, but they kept hearing, but the white crowd would never disperse, so the black men came back. Uh, and eventually, someone, and it appears to have been a disappointed office seeker, uh, somebody who thought he should be sheriff, tried to disarm one of the black men, and the gun went off, and at that point, you know, all, all, all bets were off. Yeah. Um, and then early the next morning, uh, there was uh, the, the authorities, uh, they, they had about 35 or 40 National Guardsmen, some police officers, some civilians went in and they started taking into custody all of the uh, black residents they could find. And anybody who, you know, put up a fight and shot at him uh, was shot. And so, you know, some people were killed at that point. After they, you know, and, and then a lot of black folks had just fled, you mm -hmm. know, because of what was going on. So in the wake of this, uh, arson squads, as they were called, men with torches and inflam inflammable material came in and and uh, and burned it down. They burned 35 square blocks. It's absolutely devastated. If if you've ever seen pictures of of Hiroshima, uh, it kind of looks like that actually. So you're saying initially National Guard came in. It wasn't just townsfolk. It was literally right. they had National Guards, 40 National Guardmen come in and just arresting everybody anybody who was who happened to be there yeah well black folks right right uh, so so the, the yeah the, so the explanation that was given was that they decided they didn't have enough uh men that they could trust to get between the 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 whites and the blacks they'd been fighting all night long shooting back and forth across the railroad tracks and and from neighboring uh, neighborhoods. There'd been gun gunfire going on all night. There'd been some attempts to set some fires in the black neighborhood. So the decision was made to go in and at least try and, and, and take all the black people who were left into custody uh, ostensibly for their own protection and, 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 and try and resolve it that way. And then shoot and, the ones who didn't want to be protected. And, and shoot them. Well, the, the, so the theory was is that if you resisted, you have to understand this whole thing quickly became perceived as a as a Negro uprising, uh -huh. a black uh -huh. insurrection, whatever you want to call it. So the the, the 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 Greenwood was not burned because of what happened between Dick Rowland and Sarah Page. It was burned because of these guys who went to the courthouse because nothing, I mean, I, I don't want to be flip about this, but it's true. In that day and age, nothing scared white people more than black men with guns. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that these black men would be so bold as to come right through the white downtown to the courthouse with guns was just something that could, for some white people, was just something that could not be uh, countenanced. And you know, I think they, you know, some of these people decided, okay, these black folks, they think they're big stuff. You know, they think they have some money and they think they have some independence and they have their houses and their stores and their business district and all that stuff, but we can take it away in an instant. And that's, and that's what they set about to do. And, you know, there's a lot of debate as to what role the authorities played in that whether they whether it was active or passive but in but but in the end that you know greenwood was destroyed these arson squads were they also sanctioned by the police department or were they just concerned citizens who decided i'm going to go in and burn burn down greenwood 
Well, that's that, so that's been a matter of debate for 100 years. And oh. it, according to testimony, some of the members of those arson squads were police officers, most of them out of out of uniform. And in fact, uh, so in the aftermath of all of this, of course, uh, people filed the insurance claims. Well, those were all or almost all denied because most of them didn't cover uh, riots. The, the, the insurance policies didn't cover riots. There were attempts to try and, and you know, uh, prove that the city or maybe the county or the state were liable. And um, so all of that led to what today we call a test case. And this was actually a white property owner. There were white property owners in Greenwood. And one of them was a guy named William Redfern. He owned several businesses there. He sued his insurance company. And he tried to prove that this was this was sanctioned by the the city and the state. And um, while they were able to show, as I said, that some police officers were involved in, in this arson, they they never could quite with the evidence that this was ordered by anybody in authority that the mayor or the police chief or the city uh, commission or or anybody like that actually ordered them or organized or in any way uh, uh, planned that. But so it's all le left to conjecture. And, you know, people have different uh, opinions on that. Uh -huh. and, and, and at this point, it's really hard to, to prove one way or, the, or another. So what so we knew so we found out that seven of the people in these arson squads were off duty police officers. Were there any legal repercussions to any of those people that they actually no. knew? No. What what would happen in testimony was, well, we saw these guys and, and we recognize them as police officers, but we don't know their names. I mean, you kind of got the impression that, that witnesses were intimidating. I mean, that's my impression. Uh -huh. anyway. um, so there were actually a lot of people who were arrested, uh, mostly black, but white, too for various crimes, including arson. Uh, one guy that was arrested, uh, he went by the name of Cowboy Long and he was a pretty notorious uh, outlaw and, and really kind of a, a underworld type figure. Uh, but in the end, nobody really, uh, there was one guy, a black guy who went to prison on a gun violation uh, that he claimed was trumped up you know, for all practical purposes, nothing, nothing was really done. There, there was a lot of uh, passion and a lot of activity through the summer of 1921. It, it died out at the end of the summer, and then it, it, it pretty much um, uh, descended, I guess you'd say, into this, you know, decades-long silence where people were either not inclined or afraid to talk about it. So the reports that I've seen in terms of uh, fatalities, it was somewhere around 300 fatalities. So if you're talking 7,000 population, 300 people is like 45 percent of, uh, or no, sorry, 4 percent, 4.5 percent of the population was killed. Um, were those people, were those 300 people killed in the, in the gun fighting early in the day, or were were they able to determine, or were they part of the arson at the end of the day, or was it just kind of a mixture of both? Yeah, well, so the, the, the fatalities is another thing that is, uh, the number 300 is used a lot these days. Uh -huh. But the fact of the matter is nobody really knows how many people were killed. And they actually don't know the race of all the people killed because, so we have death certificates for 37. 12 of those are white and 25 are black. From the very start, there were, uh, you know, these reports of, of bodies being taken here and there and all over the place. The National Guard said they couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't confirm how many people were killed. They said, we know of these, uh, meaning what was ultimately the 37. But we can't, we, we can't speak about whether there are other pe people, other places. And at the time, the estimates varied from 50 to 500. So to get to your original question, 
most of them would have been killed in that invasion uh, on the morning of June 1st. That we, okay. I, I call it an invasion. You know? Yeah. Most of them would have been killed in that in that period. Um, and for years after that, I mean, <laughs> so sometimes you'd run across, uh, you know, oral histories, uh, mainly from black people who claim most of the people killed were white. And because what this, so what, and what, what we had were war stories. Uh -huh. I mean, this was a war. And so what happens in war? Well, you minimize your own uh, uh, losses and you maximize the other side's losses. And um, so the, 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 the stories about, so all of the, all of this information is confusing and it's, and it's sometimes conflicting, but I think it's reasonable to say that, you know, we don't really know how many people were killed. It, it's almost certainly more than the 37 they have death certificates for. There could very easily be people buried in, in multiple places that aren't accounted for. And finding those is going to be very difficult. Have they ever... And I say that just because I, I live in Northeast Florida. I live in uh, near St. Augustine, Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can't dig anything in St. Augustine, Florida without coming across a body, right? There's just 400, 500 years worth of, of living and dying sure. there. Yeah. Has there <laughs> so ever... in America, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you honestly can't. Every now and then you'll be seeing somebody fixing the sewer system on their, their store and right. they have to stop because they find bones. Has there been anything like that in that area where there've been development and they've been uh, building something new or what have you, and they may find bones? Well, uh, nothing that's related to the massacre. Now, there is a story that goes back uh, now a long way. Uh, there was a guy who told some researchers in uh, the the 90s, I think, is when he told this story, or at least that's when they heard the story, that a guy, a, a white man as a young uh, fella, had come across some bones that had been excavated uh, near New Block Park, which is one of the areas that's been discussed as a possible burial place. Mm -hmm. And But um, the details on that have never really been worked out or nailed down and he's dead now so kind of covers that up. yeah right so that's kind of difficult um but i'm uh, yeah so i mean yeah I, I mean stuff like that happens but uh -huh. not directly related to this i mean for instance um this the town cemetery was moved in the early 1900s and as it turns out, they they didn't move everything. Right. So, so for fifty or sixty or more years, every time they're, they're, somebody did something over where the cemetery used to be, yeah, they you know they'd occasionally come up with some remains, but there's right. never been any indication that they related to this incident. Okay, so you are part of you're part of the press, and if I'm not mistaken, part of your your brief when you started this research was to also see how what the coverage was like from the press at the time and, and kind of investigate that and use that as part of your sources for for your research. What did you find when you were researching, whether it be, um, I believe it was the, the Tulsa World, uh, I believe there's, that's one of them. The yeah. Tulsa World and the Tulsa Tribune. Tulsa Tribune, yes, I'm sorry. What did yeah. you find in terms of their coverage of the event after the fact? Uh, how did they cover it? And then were there any um, black publications or other black sources of information that, and how did they differ? Well, um, yeah, so I was told by other people that, well, the newspapers didn't cover it at all. They just completely, wow. or if they did wow. cover it, you know, that the, 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 all those papers are missing. So I went to my microfilm, or not my microfilm, but the Tulsa, you know, our microfilm. The yeah. Tribune closed in 1992, okay? So when I started researching this, the Tribune had closed. But we had all their microfilms. So I went to the microfilm and just started reading it because I thought that was a place to start. 
And so I was, you know, somewhat surprised to find there was a lot of information in the newspapers. In fact, uh, the night and morning of the massacre, the world put out three extra editions besides their regular morning edition. And um, so there was a lot of information in there, but of course you had to read it critically. And, you know, it, it was almost, almost all from a white, point of view, and it was also uh, to varying degrees. You know, newspapers in those days, we, 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 today we complain about the media being too political. Well, you know, originally, the me that's what they did. The right, media right, right. Political. And so uh, even in, you know, in the 1920s, the, these two competing newspapers had different interests in different angles and different, you know, uh, perspectives, I guess you would say. And they that they reported on things a little differently, uh, but but generally, you know, it was uh, it was uh, they wanted to. I think they wanted to report accurately, but they also wanted to minimize the damage to the to the city's reputation. Uh, Tulsa was a very proud place; it had grown so quickly, and you know, had all these things going on. Uh, in terms of other publications, you know, that there, there had been, a, you know, the black newspaper, the, the Tulsa Star, mm -hmm. but it, it, of course, was destroyed and the, and the uh, editor and publisher had fled because he was one of the people that was being blamed for what happened. Um, <clears throat> there was a pretty influential newspaper in Oklahoma City called the Black Dispatch. And, and they, and it reported on, in fact, it published the um, story about uh, Dick Rowland's arrest under the headline, the story that set Tulsa ablaze. In other words, that they pinpointed that story. Mm -hmm. um, Walter White from the NAACP uh, was in Tulsa within a few days of what happened. And he reported on it in the crisis, which was, and still is, the NAACP's uh, publication. Um, there were some other publications, but... Um, I don't know that they were, they, they were real reliable. Now, there were some, uh, the, the New York Times reported quite a bit on it. They had a correspondent here, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported on it pretty thoroughly. They had a correspondent, that paper had a correspondent here, too. So, and then, and then it, but it was in papers all over, uh, all over the United States and in, and in Europe. What was the, what was the, the immediate aftermath like? for the black community there uh, obviously their their entire area was burned down essentially just obliterated what was the pro what was their process like for getting themselves they ultimately rebuilt right they rebuilt the yeah. the entire area but they had challenges right the city the city of Tulsa put some some zoning issues in their way can you talk about that as well what that initial aftermath was like and then the struggle they had to rebuild so the, the Tribune and some other people had before the massacre had been sort of campaigning against uh, Greenwood and uh, writing some not very flattering stories. So when it was burned, um, several people, some real estate people, some business people, um, the Tribune, they, they started pushing the idea that the, the black district should be moved further out of town. And um, so they went to the black property owners with the proposition uh, that they, that, that, that this group would sell them uh, lots further out to build their homes and they would be provided with sewers and public transportation and all this stuff, things they didn't actually have in Greenwood, by the way. And if they would move, but the catch was, is that they had to move before they got the money for their property that had been burned. And the black property owners got together and said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. We want our money up front and we want to be paid for, you know, the full value. Right. This group, this group didn't have the resources to do that. They didn't have the money. And for whatever reason, the people who did have money in Tulsa apparently decided they weren't going to back this. So they didn't. But what happened, uh, so then uh, there was a big falling out between the city 
Commission and the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce was against this scheme. The City Commission was for it. C city Commission then extended the city limits to include all of all of the what was called the burn district. And, this, and by doing that, they put it under the fire code, which meant, you know, they had to build what were considered fireproof uh, buildings. And it was believed that this would prevent them for, from rebuilding. Well, several things happened. One, one was that, to their surprise, they found out that the, some of the black property owners did have the, the, the uh, access to money or credit mm -hmm. to start rebuilding immediately, and they did. And then there were others who just started rebuilding whether they had permission to do it or not. And apparently they did a lot of it at night. There, there was one story uh, where the city building inspector, apparently there was only one, was being chastised for allowing these, you know, these structures to go up in the burn district. And his response was, well, I work eight to five. They're not doing anything eight to five. When I come back, I leave at five o'clock in the evening. And when I come back in the morning, they put up another, <laughs> they put up another house or, you know, whatever it was. And, uh, and so um, several of the property owners uh, brought lawsuits against the city. And essentially what they argued was that this, that this was done, the, the expansion of the fire code was done not in the interest of public safety, but to take the, the, the property. And, uh, and there, there were uh, black and white attorneys representing them on this. It went to all three county uh, judges heard it at the same time, late August, they ruled in favor of the black property owners. And that was pretty much the end of the, of the uh, removal scheme. And then building began pretty, you know, in real earnest after that. What what was the prevailing feeling about why they stayed? I, mean, I guess my uh, that was my first thought is why stay and rebuild? Would you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a very a very good point. And and I, you know, when you ask that, and I think you know, in some cases, I think it it was just. Uh, uh, well, if I leave, and I, especially the property owners, if I leave, um, I'm going to have to, you know, give up this little bit of property that I've worked for years to, to acquire and for, you know, probably almost nothing, you know, mm -hmm. because it would be a, 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 a sold under duress. Some of them had good jobs they didn't want to give up. Uh, in some cases, they had employers who helped them or even let them come and live with them. Um, there were also people, black people who moved to Tulsa, moved to Tulsa after the massacre because there were, there were opportunity opportunity, opportunities yeah. here. I mean, uh, there was a lot of construction going on. And so, I mean, I know one fairly prominent or very prominent family in Tulsa, they moved here. They had one uncle here, or there was one man who lived here, and he told you know the rest of the family, "Hey, come on, we got a lot of work to do," and they moved to Tulsa from South Carolina, and you know worked in the construction trades. Wow, and, and eventually branched into other things. So, um, you know, there was still opportunity here. I don't know if it says anything about what the rest of the country was like at that time for for black people that they would rather stay in a place where they you know got burned out and shot at but yeah. um they had literally just watched firing squads come across come across their their yeah. city city lines shooting anybody who was resisting them then setting the whole place on fire and their first reaction is hey come on over we there's a lot of opportunity here we're building that that just speaks to the resiliency of it i mean that's just amazing to me you know, I, I think these folks are awfully amazing, both before and after, because as I got into this and I realized just how, you know, I don't think most of us realize that in a lot of places in, in America in the, in the 19-teens and 1920s, Black people, their existence was still not that much different than slavery. Yeah. And in fact, and in fact, while all of this was going on, or shortly before it, the former governor of, I think it was Florida, 
was arrested for for slavery. <laughs> he was he was he had slaves on his on his farm on his plantation. Um, so, um, well, it was only maybe one generation, right? It was you know, it's only sixty yeah. less than sixty years from uh, the emancipation, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. So I mean, it was it was a real. Um, That in many cases they were, you know, there's a son, there's a story about 16 tons about the guys working in the coal mines and they owe their soul to the company store yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. In a lot of cases, uh, black people working on, uh, who worked on farms and plantations and stuff like that, it was the same thing. They were they were theoretically free, but they were kept on the land by, uh, you know, what was called debt peonage and, and things like that. So. So they, they came to a place like Tulsa and they just did everything they could to, to uh, make something they could be proud of. And many of them worked at more than one thing. One of the big property owners was a guy named Jim Cherry. And if you go through the city directory in various years, he's listed as a plumber, a grocery store owner, a real estate guy. He was a deputy sheriff for a while. Um, and then he, he owned property. I mean, the people who were kind of the, the core of the community, they seem to have made uh, made their money by, you know, they got there early, they bought property, they saved their money, right? they bought more property, they built rental property. And, you know, but, you know, they, 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 they really worked hard. And, and that's one of the things that makes the whole story so heartbreaking. What has been the lasting impact of that event on the people of Tulsa has there been I mean there has to be some type of residual impact of that in just their collective history uh, what do you think that is well I would say one thing and I don't know how I don't know how this compares to other cities but there is a lingering deep distrust of yeah. the, of the city's black population of city government of, of uh, white people and there's also to this day a real sense of ownership of that of that Greenwood and Archer area, and and, and there's some pretty fierce fights over that still, and um, so that's part of it. I think, you know, one thing that happened was that it tended to drive blacks and whites further apart, you know, when it happened, yeah. and I and, yeah. it, and it's taken a long time to start to to patch that up. Um, you know, in some way, in some ways, I think people, especially black people, they look at the, the totality of their situation if they're unhappy, and um, and they blame it on that event. And it may, in fact, have very little to do with that event. And mm -hmm. you can make an argument that that event is only the most obvious uh, manifestation of you know a continuum of of things, uh, there's a big distrust of police. Now I know that's everywhere, but, 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 but I mean, that's something that's been here throughout. Yeah. And I, I don't know that it's consciously tied to that, but sometimes these, 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 um, uh, social, uh, attitudes get passed along without, right reasons for the attitude in other words it's not necessarily we don't trust the police because they burned our place down a hundred years ago it's just you don't trust the police yeah, yeah. and uh, ultimately you lose the actual reason you just you just re retain the feeling re and yeah. you find new you find new reasons yeah. I mean you know and some of them are valid and some of them may not be valid I know you know I mean we and this works for everybody we all we all sometimes see uh, what we expect to see or what we want to see. Well, there was, a, I believe, uh, a 1997, I believe, something like that, late 90s commission that examined the event in Tulsa, right? And the final determination was that the city of Tulsa was culpable for the damage and the destruction. And they were, I guess they were talking about uh, reparations or um, some type of um, uh, payment or, or making the, the survivors of yeah. those families uh, repayment for their loss. 
was anything actually ever did it ever come of that? I think that was the that was the suggestion at the time, but did anything actually come of it? Um, not not really. I mean, there was a group that was mainly the the Unitarians came in and and gave the and there were actually probably a hundred or so survivors still alive at that time. And, and it was only to the survivors. Yeah. Um, and then the chamber of commerce, uh, there were some people in the chamber of commerce that were talking about trying to, to make some kind of a, a payment settlement, whatever you want to call it, uh, privately, you know, this would not be done by the city of Tulsa. It'd be done by, you know, through private, uh, contributions, if you will. And um, so then in 2003, a group of lawyers came in and filed a lawsuit on behalf of survivors and families. And that caused a lot of hard feelings. And that, uh, so that thing, that, 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 that effort ended. Uh, nothing came of the lawsuit. Uh, and so that's where we are today. It, you know, with the centennial coming, it's been it, uh, that that's been taken back up. Mm -hmm. And actually, the you know, so uh, the idea for uh, the the idea for the commission back in the late nineties actually originated with something that was done in Florida, which was uh, the uh, investigation into the Rosewood incident. So, and I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. No, I'm not. Okay, so so there was this incident similar to this in Florida in a rural uh, coastal area. There was a little settlement called Rosewood. It was a black community. And uh, basically there was a war between it and an adjoining white community. And, and the black community wound up, you know, disappearing basically. And, and the whole story was, uh, uh, brought back up, I think by the, or by an Orlando Sentinel reporter. Uh, I don't remember when he first started writing about it, but at any rate, it led to some action in the Florida legislature. Uh, Florida was a lot more Democrat in those days. And, uh, and it led to some action where, where, the, where those, uh, families receive some payments. And, and so that kind of sparked the idea of that and, and some compensation to the uh, uh, Japanese uh, who'd been interned during right. World War II. So that kind of led to you know, what happened as far as uh, getting a, a, a commission in Oklahoma. Well, one of my questions, and because I again I'm from Ohio, and I, I, had, never, I had never heard of that uh, this of this ever before in Ohio, um, but obviously it is something that is is at least part of the consciousness in Tulsa. It may not maybe necessarily be taught in the history class in school. I don't know if it is or not, but at least it does uh, come up. And we are coming up on a hundred years now since the event, what May thirty first of of this year. Uh, are there um, as far as you know, is there some type of memorial service scheduled or is there something to commemorate that event? Yeah, so there's centennial plans going on and they've been a little bit uh, close to the vest about that. I think they're hoping to get some pretty big uh, names to participate. But at any rate, they're in the process of building a history center for Greenwood that would include it would include the massacre, but the objective is to to really cover the entire history mm -hmm. uh, of that community, uh, because there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of pride in the in the successes of Greenwood. They don't really want it to be all about you know getting burned burned down and people killed and that sort of thing. Right. Well, I I thank you very much, Randy, for for joining me tonight. Um, like I said, I, it was it was as interesting as I thought it would be, and and I I. It, again, it speaks to just the, the issue we're having right now where if some aspect of history offends someone, we have to erase it and we have to not be able to think about it again for our own, you know, it makes us feel better. Whereas I, I think that those those things personally if, it should be every now and then, you, you know, you should touch on them again just to 
just to validate that, yes, it did happen. Yes, uh, bad things do happen, and we can learn and grow and go forward from it, rather than just uh, basically erasing things from existence. So I, I really um, I appreciate you spending the time with me tonight. And um, is there anything else that you are currently uh, working on that you'd like to take a moment and, and plug uh, before we go? <laughs> No, not really. I mean, uh, m mostly, um, mostly, I'm, I'm I'm working on the Oklahoma legislature right now, so that's keeping me pretty busy. And I don't know if I'll be, you know, I, I, I am also covering uh, stuff related to the uh, centennial and 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 that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. but, um, no, I, I I just you know I, I I like for people to to not only pay attention to this but realize. That this sort of thing happened all over the country. Right, exactly. And I mean, I, you mentioned Ohio. I don't know of anything specific to Ohio, but um, you know, there there was a big lynching in Duluth, Minnesota, for crying out loud. So I mean, this stuff happened all over. And 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 it, although we tend to think of it mainly as involving blacks, uh, you know, in the Western United States, it, it also involved uh, Chinese and and other Asians. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that, that is something that, that I think, um, we've, we've tended to not want to address. Right. And yeah. it, it's something that I think we all have to come to terms with. And I'm not just talking about white America. I yeah. think everybody yeah. has to come to terms with it. No, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more for sure. Um. So once again, uh, Randy Crable, you can find more about Randy at his website, randycrable.com, and his book, Tulsa 1921, Reporting a Massacre. You can find that on Amazon as well. Uh, thank you so much, Randy, for joining me. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So, okay, there we go. We're, we had a, a history lesson tonight, and I... Like I said, I, I did not know anything about it. And I'm sure there are hundreds of episodes just like this one that aren't taught historically to young children growing up. Um, but it just calls into question what is history? What is I – mean, history really is, is what's written. If nobody writes about it, nobody uh, provides this oral tradition or a written tradition of an event – then it didn't happen. Suddenly it was, it's no longer there. You know, uh, people will remember it for a bit, but eventually people pass on. And then if, if we don't have those written histories listed and taught, like we say, we, you know, if we don't remember the past, we're doomed to repeat it. And I just found it such an incredible story that um, one section of town, a white section of town could just kind of walk into the other section of town with the National Guard and shoot at people and uh, the American government shooting people uh, and killing them. And it just kind of brings us back, you know, in some small way to where we are right now, where with this constant cloud over the heads of the people in the United States, unrest for the last year or so. And, you know, let's let's destroy the things that make us feel bad. Let's destroy the things that make us think or make us uncomfortable even a little bit. Let's just get rid of them and wipe them away so that we don't have to think critically about what happened. And I was interested to find out the story and find out exactly you know, that there were precipitating events on both sides. You know, there were individuals that came into um, came to the sheriff's department for, for Dick Rowland, and they were armed. Maybe they shouldn't have been. Maybe that them being armed inflamed uh, an already pretty hostile situation. There are places, there are ways to learn from all of that. Should they have come, should the National Guard and the white citizens have come across uh, the city line and started shooting people? Hell no, obviously not. Should they have been held accountable after they did? Yes, they should have. Should the people who burned the city down been held accountable for that? You obviously knew who they were. You, you identified them as being police officers. If you know the police officers, how many police officers are there? Why not just throw them all up in a lineup and say, which one of these police officers did you see? There are seven of them that they identified originally, but they just can't uh, remember their name. There are ways to make this happen. They obviously had no desire to make this happen, so it didn't. And so, you know, then the newspapers are 
covering this primarily from uh, the white point of view, uh, you know, the black antagonizers. And there is no other counterpoint to that. And so that is where, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, the quote unquote fake news been around forever. News has been the vessel of miscommunication and misdirection and misinformation forever. Uh, they write what they are told to write. They don't necessarily write what, um, in all cases, what the actual events are in a dispassionate way. Everybody has bias. So do reporters. So do people who put the news together and they provide it to you. Eventually, that becomes the truth. I think I've said it before. If you keep saying something loud enough and long enough, that becomes the truth. So uh, people like Randy coming in and writing a book about what happened uh, reviewing and researching the news coverage of the time to see how it how it was. Was it overly biased? Was it reliable? What could it have been deemed reliable for the events that occurred? And then what did some of the black publications of the time, what was their side of that story and how did they differ? And was the truth somewhere in between? Probably, usually, the truth is somewhere in between the two stories. But we can't just brush them under the rug. That's my point to it. That's the reason we had this history lesson tonight. That's the reason I, I found this to be incredibly interesting uh, and something I would recommend for all of you to read. Tulsa 1921, reporting a massacre. 300 people, uh, upwards of 300, maybe 500 people out of 7,000 uh, were killed. So you have anywhere, you know, four and a half to, I don't know, five, six percent of the population was killed. And uh, mo many of them fled. A lot of them never came back. A lot of the big money people that started the city left and didn't come back. Uh, to their credit, they were able to rebuild it. And I, I found that to be amazing. They're amazingly resilient that they were able to build that back up after they had been burned down. I don't know many people who would say, okay, you've come in and completely destroyed my life. I'm going to stay here next to you and rebuild it. That's uh, an incredible statement. What are your thoughts? You can contact us on our Gmail account. It's provemewrongcast at gmail.com. Or you can contact us on the comment section on YouTube, comment section on Rumble, comment section on our podcast platform itself. Let us know what you think. Uh, is there another situation like the race massacre of 1921 that I should have on the, on the show? Again, I'm sure there are a lot of events like this for uh, all kinds of different um, race of people, whether it be the Japanese internment camps, whether it be the, the different uh, the race massacres, things like that. These types of things happened. Uh, we should not run from them. We should not sweep them under the rug. We should revisit them, uh, feel the, the shame rightly, and move on and be a better person going forward. You can also find us on Facebook. It is Prove Me Wrong. That's the name of the program, facebook.com backslash prove me wrong. If you are looking for ways to listen to the podcast itself, you can find us on any number of podcast platforms, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, iTunes, any platform that you use to listen to uh, podcasts, you can find the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Like and subscribe to the show and you'll be notified when a brand new episode releases. We typically release one every week. Uh, you know, click on notifications. You'll be notified on your phone when a brand new episode is released, and you can be the first on your block to listen to the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Like I mentioned before, we also have a YouTube account and a Rumble account. YouTube.com backslash Prove Me Wrong. Rumble.com backslash Prove Me Wrong. Like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. You will be notified when a brand new episode re releases, and you can actually watch the video portion of the show. You, if you are listening to the audio right now, I did have a video of Randy and myself discussing uh, his book. I did have a, a screenshot of the book up on the screen at certain points so you can see what it looks like. If you're looking for it, you can find it on Amazon.com. Also, if you like the, the work that we do here with the Proven Around Podcast and you would like to support us, we have a Patreon account as well. It's patreon.com backslash PMW Podcast. If you become a patron to the PMW podcast, you will be um, you have additional content available to you that is not currently published on our podcast or um, our video platforms, and uh, you will be ahead of the game. We have a specific content just for patrons. Once again, Patreon.com/backslash PMW Podcast. 
And uh, again, if you like what you hear and you'd like to support us, we would certainly appreciate that. Before we go tonight, I did want to say that our sponsor tonight are Zendo Zone Citronella Candles from JT Eaton. And here is my Zendo Zone right there. They are shaped like fearless bug repellent tiki gods. See, it's a tiki god. So let's, um, so let's surf and stand. Hawaiian Howie and Luau Lily bring the islands to your backyard with Zendo Zone Citronella Burners. They, uh, they use natural 3% citronella candles and incense cones. And they're perfect for patios, decks, backyards, campsites, poolside, and more. You can enjoy the outdoors again. They are available on Amazon.com and at select Ace Hardware stores. Go ahead and pick yours up today. Once again, Randy Crable was my guest tonight. His book is Tulsa 1921, Reporting a Massacre. Look it up, folks. It's history. It's history that will make you uncomfortable, but it's something that we all need to revisit. Uh, these, these things are important. My name is Pete Lee. This is the Prove Me Wrong podcast, and I hope to see you again soon.